the most complicated thing we know of by many orders of magnitude and the probability that you can understand yourself in anything approaching totality is extraordinarily low what's healthy mentally and what's not is partly social judgment and it's partly socially constructed and it partly has to do with norms and it partly has to do with ideals, because you might also say that to be healthy is to be normal but you could also say that to be healthy is to be ideal and then of course you run into the problem of having to conceptualize an ideal and it isn't self-evident that science is capable of conceptualizing an ideal because ideals tend to fall into the domain of moral judgments, say or philosophical judgments rather than scientific judgments per se so what I would say to you is that it would be worthwhile to approach this course as if you were an engineer of the human spirit an engineer of your own spirit to begin with but also an engineer of the spirits of other people because as you interact with other people you inevitably tell them what you want and what you don't want when they give you what you want and what you admire, you respond positively to them you pay attention to them, you smile at them, you focus you focus your thoughts on them, you interact with them and you reward them for acting in a particular manner and when they don't respond the way that you want, then you punish them with a look, or by turning away, or by rejecting their friendship, or when you're a child, by refusing to play for them, play with them and so, we're engaged in the co-creation of personalities, our own and others and that also brings up the same question what is it that we are all collectively trying to be and trying to create I suspect that you all have the experience of falling short of the ideal an ideal that you hold for yourself or an ideal that other people hold for you I suspect that you all feel the negative consequences of falling short of that ideal we have personalities, that's who you are now but our personalities are also capable of transformation, of change I mean, obviously we think about that as learning um, some of that might be regarded as factual learning and some of it might be regarded as learning how to perceive and behave and I would say that the, the clinical psychologists that we'll cover to begin with are much more concerned with the nature of the implicit structures that shape your perceptions and also the implicit structures that shape your behaviors and how they're integrated in relationship to your negative emotion, health and well-being whereas the thinkers in the second half are more concerned about laying out the structural elements of those features and relating them to underlying, say, mechanistic phenomena I've often found it useful when I'm trying to remember something to have a story to hang the facts on otherwise you're faced with the necessity of doing nothing but memorization and it isn't obvious to me that memorization actually constitutes knowledge um, what constitutes knowledge is the generation of a cognitive structure that enables you to conduct yourself more appropriately in life and so I suppose you might say that a course in psychology you could argue that a course in psychology, especially in personality is a course in applied wisdom as well assuming that wisdom is in part your capacity to understand yourselves so that you don't so that you don't present too much of an intolerable mystery to yourself and also to understand others so that you can predict their behavior 
understand their motivations, negotiate with them, listen to them, and formulate joint games with them so that you can integrate yourself reasonably well with another person and with a family and in society. Personality psychologists gathered together adjectives within the English language first that were used to describe human beings as many adjectives as they could collect and then subjected them to a process called factor analysis and what factor analysis does is enable you statistically to determine in some sense how similar adjectives are to one another so for example if you gave a thousand people a list of adjectives to describe themselves with and one of the adjectives was happy and another of the ad adjectives was social you'd find that those who rated themselves high on happy would also rate themselves high on social and those who rated themselves low on happy would also rate themselves low on social and by looking at those patterns of covariation you can determine what the essential dimensions are of human personality one of the dimensions is roughly happiness that's extroversion another dimension is neuroticism it's a negative emotion dimension so if you ask someone if they're anxious and they score high say on a scale of one to seven they're also likely to score high on another item that says that they're sad and it turns out that negative emotions clump together and so that people who experience more of one negative emotion have a propensity to experience more of all of them there's another dimension called agreeableness and agreeable people are self-sacrificing compassionate and polite if you're dealing with an agreeable person they don't like conflict they care for other people um, if you're dealing with an agreeable person they're likely to put your concerns ahead of theirs they're non-competitive and cooperative uh, it's a dimension where women are women score more highly than men on agreeableness across cultures including those cultures where the largest steps have been taken towards producing an egalitarian social circumstance like Scandinavia actually the gender differences in personality there are larger than they are anywhere else um, another trait is conscientiousness conscientiousness is an excellent trait if you want to do well in in school and in work especially if you're a manager and administrator I can't say we understand a lot about conscientiousness although it it reliably emerges from factor analytic studies of adjective groups across different countries conscientious people are diligent industrious and orderly their orderliness tilts them towards political conservatism by the way because it turns out that your inbuilt temperament your inbuilt personality which constitutes a set of filters through which you view the world also alters the manner in which you process information